Okay, so let's talk uh, about instrumentation in the brain. We'll go through this relatively quickly because a lot is not known. There's a lot of basic opportunity, but, but uh, and then we'll get to our case study at the end. This is just a useful resource for you. It gives you an indication of this temporal and spatial scales over which different categories of diagnosis and intervention reside. But you can see there's nothing really spanning everything. So usually, there's usually a trade-off. If you want high speed, you tend to be more focused, focused on one uh, very substructure. If you really want to look globally, you tend to sacrifice immensely in spatial and temporal. And I'll give you some examples of that. We have what's called magnetoencephalography. This is a way of picking up signals in the brain that are generated magnetically and turning them in, into uh, currents that you can detect. Um, and so this is a bit like EEG, electroencephalography, a little bit spa better spatial resolution, uh, about five-fold. You can get about two millimeter resolution. It's very fast. Basically uses Maxwell's equations to, to, to calculate uh, that there was uh, some synchronized activity that uh, was occurring in a particular spot in the brain. EG is much simpler, a uh, little bit less resolution, but uh, you can just use basically a shower cap with a lot of uh, wires on it. And, but again, because both of these are extracellular, they can only pick up synchronous activity, uh, millions and millions of neurons that are firing together. And then you can barely pick up a signal at the surface of the brain. But you can, you got sort of centimeter resolution uh, and very high temporal resolution. And that, you can see these different oscillations that happen. These are brain waves. Different frequencies, so-called uh, alpha, beta, theta, delta. Delta shows up in, in deep sleep. Alpha during uh, arousal and attention. See if your eyes are closed and then a typical cortex when your eyes open, you see this much uh, lower amplitude, higher frequency uh, alpha rhythm. And then you close your eyes and the occipital lobe, you get back to a sort of a slower, uh, higher amplitude uh, delta wave. And you can see abnormal activity. These tend to slow in dementia. Uh, non-specifically across all frequencies. These seizures, you can start to see, if you're recording, uh, uh, heavily synchronized activity at the onset of a seizure. And so that can be used uh, for diagnosis. Functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, picks up changes in oxygen consumption, the ratio of oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, it can be picked up as a ma magnetic susceptibility difference on a particular kind of a Won't delve into the details of it here, but this gives you a flavor of the sort of resolution you can get. These blobs indicate uh, sort of centimeter scale uh, changes in oxygen utilization, which means the neurons are more active in that particular. PET scanning is relating to glucose metabolism, uh, and that uses uh, positron emission from uh, modified uh, uh, glucose as a PET label, for example. Uh, so you can have um, a modified glucose uh, that's uh, uptaken more in highly active brain regions. And so you can pick up the concentration of the uh, glucose and you can get, again, the sort of low spatial resolution. But it lets you see if someone's thinking, you can see a PET signal in frontal cortex. If they're hearing something, you can see a PET signal in auditory cortex. Uh, visual uh, uh, stimulation, you can tend to see something in the occipital uh, cortex. And so it gives you that sort of low level resolution. Something we worked on is uh, a structural study uh, that lets you see the brain uh, uh, current structure. We've done this in mouse and human brains. This is a mouse brain over some text, actually, text written by Ramoni Cajal, the Spanish anatomist, before and after the clarity procedure. You can read text right through it, but they're actually sitting right there. And we do that by uh, removing all the lipids. The lipids are what cause light scattering. They make the brain opaque because they scatter photons that would otherwise pass through tissue. Do that by first building in a very dense, uh, uh, covalently linked hydrogel structure within the brain. And that let, lets us very vigorously use detergents and electrophoresis to, to force all the lipids out. And so the brain becomes. And so that, that's pretty cool. You can, this is a whole mouse brain where you can see projections going all the way through it. Um, this is a movie play of a brain labeled here. Each of these are neurons. Cortex, this is hippocampus. Little blobs are uh, 
scale bars, each of those little things. And you can kind of look through. It's like a fantastic voyage type thing you can fly around. The particular label here is yellow fluorescent protein that's present in long-range projection neurons. It's a hollow long track that the cortex, the cervix of the brain. Campus. So we're using that for a variety of things, looking at human samples, looking for abnormalities in axon, uh, uh, three-dimensional structure in autism, for example. That's a high-resolution structure. And there's a lot of other things you could do with it, we're working on ways of actually making the gel conducting, too, so we could have active interrogation.